Okay, I think we'll we'll get started. Um, good morning, everyone. It's it's great to see you all for this week's colloquium. Um, for those of you that that I don't know, I'm Krista Thompson. I'm the assistant dean of graduate studies at SUNY Poly. We're delighted to have our recent John J. Sullivan Professional Development Award recipients here today to, pr to present their experiences. After retirement, John J. Sullivan worked as a visiting senior scientist of nanotechnology at CNSE. He received a bachelor's and master's degree in physics from Northeastern University. He was a United States Army veteran and spent 30 years at MKS Instruments in Andover, Massachusetts. While at MKS, he was a great supporter and friend to the Albany nanotechnology community and was a mentor to students and staff. He retired as vice president of marketing at MKS in 2000 after a 30 year career there. John J. Sullivan passed away in January 2010. John was committed to CNSE's growth as a world-class research and educational institution and established that legacy by helping CNSE create a scholarship to advance that goal. In the past, the award was given to one graduate student annually and primarily used to support research. Beginning in 2018, the Office of Graduate Studies has expanded the potential impact of the award to allow for more students to benefit from this scholarship. We are delighted to share the John J. Sullivan Professional Development Award recipients' experiences at today's colloquium. The award is bestowed to graduate students to further enable experiential and scholarly opportunities within nanotechnology or related fields during their studies. Graduate students with strong classroom and laboratory academic records are encouraged to apply. Awards typically range from 2,000 to 8,000, but larger awards may be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. The award is intended to offset the cost of experiential and scholarly opportunities such as training events and programs, research experiences, either academic or within industry, patent development, workshop travel or attendance, conference travel or registration, and other professional development activity. A sincere thank you to the Scholarship Selection Committee for their review and input, and congratulations again to the following recipients. Sarah Evke, Vincent Myers, Ben McEwen, Jody Hotellen, May Lee, Zach Olmsted, Devika Vipin, Pujitha Ramesh, and Bridget Boland. And without further ado, I will turn this over to Sarah to begin uh, the presentations. Okay, great. Thank you, Krista. Okay, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Yes. Okay, fantastic. Um, let me just minimize this. So good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Afke. For those that do not know me, I am a fourth year graduate student at the Nanobioscience Constellation. Um, I'm under the advisements of Dr. Thomas Begley, who was a former CNSC faculty member who's now moved over to Albany, and um, our current interim dean, Dr. Andre Melendez. Um, I'm going to present to you uh, my experience at the Society of Free Radical Biology and Medicine um, annual meeting um, that took place in um, mid-November. It was a three-day conference in good old Las Vegas, Nevada. And I presented my work, um, The Protective Role of the Epitranscriptome Against Acetaminophen Toxicity. And I want to first thank, of course, John J. Sullivan and the award searching committee for granting me the opportunity to actually go out to the West Coast for the first time and um, share my work there. And um, here I would like to present you my experience. Um, to give some background over um, what the conference entailed, um, the first day, more of a pre-conference day, um, there's a Sunrise Free Radical School. And basically, um, this were various presentations that were given from um, many experts in the field that really dove deeper into more or less basic biology concepts um, that were specific to oxidative stress. Um, there were also seminars given um, in the main conference days of course, um, they were given by different various training levels from either graduate students, postdoc level scientists, um, all the way up to faculty members as well. So um, it was great as a graduate student to sit in the audience and listen to 
um, these experts in the field of various levels and where they are in their work. Um, so that was a very eye-opening experience for me. And of course, um, what was very relevant to the John J. Sullivan Award um, that they offered at this conference that I attended one of these sessions, um, this conference had professional development sessions and they're broken up into three tracks here in which we had to choose one. Um, the one that I chose specifically to attend was how to publish a strong paper in redox biology and I will go over that um, a little later in the presentation uh, in deeper uh, concepts. And then also um, the largest, most networking opportunity, majority of us graduate students get to attend our poster sessions. And that was taken, evening poster sessions were every day of the conference. Of course, we were only um, uh, presenting at one of those sessions. Um, so here's uh, my poster that I presented at the conference. Um, mine is right here. I was right up in front and center, so I had really prime real estate. And the work um, I presented is to the left here. Um, I'm not going to go through this in depth. I'm just trying to keep under the five minute constraint. Um, but basically, my thesis project that I work on, um, I study how the epitranscriptome, which is modification on RNA species, specifically for mine as a transfer RNA. So, this tRNA is the main molecule that's responsible in growing a polypeptide. Um, protein molecule. And so um, I study how different stress, and in this case, I look at the toxicity of acetaminophen and how we have gene and protein um, regulation in when the, our system organism is exposed uh, to this toxicant. And we phenotypically see overall that our mice that are um, deficient in a current, in a specific um, epitranscriptomic writer, um, we see that there is a phenotypical difference um, when these animals are exposed to stress compared to the wild type counterpart. So this was my main kind of source of uh, professional development that I experienced here. It was great to uh, speak one-on-one -on -one, um, with many different people of many different backgrounds from MDs to MD PhDs to other graduate students, postdocs, and I really got great um, feedback on my work and also um, some avenues and ways that I could move forward in my project as well. And overall, just um, networking was great, fantastic. The other thing that this conference did um, that many other scientific conferences that didn't do that I was, that I was able to attend was that they had um, a blue circle sticker marker. So basically those who were looking for um, employment opportunities after graduation had a light blue sticker on their ID badge. And those that had employer opportunities had a blue um, sticker on their badge. So I thought that was a great way to kind of facilitate networking and to get us graduate students like myself that are ready to graduate and go on to the workforce to kind of see which individuals are um, there for that are looking for um, employees as well. Um, so again, the professional uh, development session that I um, attended was this one that you see here. I took a couple of pictures um, from that seminar. Um, it was how to publish a strong paper in redox biology and avoid fatal errors and rigor in redox methods. So um, this session was hosted by Dr. Trent Teipel and um, Miss Samantha Gordano Muga. Um, and so they did a great job facilitating this discussion. Um, we really took a great chunk of time um, facilitating discussions on how as us as scientists can um, produce papers that really have great reproducibility and rigor, um, something that the NIH has um, pushed in the past year to increase that as well. And we got into a great discussion. I typically work on mice, so we had a uh, 20 minute discussion on how statistically we can um, do our experiments to get the most data out of our mice and make sure that has a rep reproducibility and rigor that they are looking for in strong papers um, that they want in their redox biology journals. And furthermore, um, in the overall experience of um, my conference, I kind of touched on this in the beginning as well, 
but the John J. Sullivan Award was allow, allowed me to listen to dynamic lectures that were given um, by many leaders in the field of redox biology. I was able to expand my networking skills, like I said, especially at the poster session, I was able to talk to a wide variety of people at different training levels, and they all gave me excellent feedback on my work, and I really appreciate that, as well as employment opportunities as well. I talked to some people um, about some potential postdoc positions, and so um, that was really crucial for me as well, for my professional development particularly. And also again, in this conference, um, they had dedicated professional development sessions of um, the other two that I didn't touch on um, was the grant review section. So how to write a strong grant. And then also um, this was a little bit more faculty uh, focused, but transitioning from a non-tenure research to an academic tenure track position was also offered as well. So I thought that was really nice too, that they had a broad development session that um, everyone from every different training a level could actually attend and get something from it. Um, and then from there, I just wanna thank again, the award committee um, for allowing me to travel to Las Vegas. Please, here are some pictures from my trip. I had a great time. It was definitely a colorful experience. And um, yeah, thank you again. And um, congrats to all the other graduate students. And um, I look forward to seeing their presentations. Hello, everyone. Let me switch to my screen sharing view here. All right. Uh, good morning. My name is Vincent Myers. I'm a third year PhD student under the supervision of Shadi Shahedapur Sandvik. And uh, today I'll discuss the work that I presented at the 13th International Conference on Nitrate Semiconductors in Bellevue, Washington. As a result of receiving the, the John J. Sullivan Professional Development Award, I was able to travel to the conference and present the research, which I'll take the next few minutes to review. If I can change the slide. There we go. Uh, to briefly outline my talk today, I'll discuss the work that I presented at the conference, starting with the importance of GAN to power electronics, the need for an effective PGAN etching technique, uh, the dry etching and photoelectrochemistry of GAN, uh, and then discuss the measurement of surface damage uh, by in GAN by dry etch and the characterization of the photoelectrochemical etch process, and then summarize my professional development experience. The three nitride system material system has a wide and tunable band gap uh, and a high breakdown field that make it well suited for the future power electronics. Devices made using GAN can theoretically operate at higher voltages and frequencies and with lower power loss than silicon or silicon carbide. To create devices with uh, low loss power transmission, the need for high quality P-type ohmic contacts in selectively doped regions is salient. A common method of forming these regions is through dry etching, which offers fast, controllable, and highly anisotropic etching of GAN. However, the dry etching process causes electrical damage at the surface, which requires removal of the damage layer in order to form ohmic contacts. In P-type GAN, no ohmic uh, 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 excuse me, in P-type GAN, no removal mechanism has yet been documented without high temperature treatment, which can compromise the process flows uh, with low thermal budget. So understanding how this damage is formed gives us insight into how the damaged material can be removed. Dry etching, like the commonly used uh, inductively coupled plasma reactive ion etch, have physical and chemical etch mechanisms. The physical effect of uh, sputtering is primarily responsible for the breakage of the gallium nitrogen bond and it desorbs nitrogen, which volatilizes in the etch chamber and induces donor-like nitrogen vacancies near the surface. The depth of uh, this damaged layer is thought to be between 40 and 60 nanometers. Um, as you can see in the schematic on the right, in, in type GAN, this isn't a serious problem since added surface donors don't necessarily compromise the ability to form ohmic contacts. However, in P-type GAN, the etch induced defects flip the majority carrier from holes to electrons. We documented this effect, as you can see in the figure on the left. Um, in P-type in GAN, using a BCL3 chlorine argon chemistry, we grew 300 nanometers of PGAN by MOCVD and then etched the surface with ICV Ry for 30 seconds. Surface characterization performed before and after the etch shows a modestly rougher surface induced by the dry etch. And 
uh, Hall effect measurements show that the majority carrier type in the PGAN did indeed flip from holes to electrons, thus justifying the need for a reliable triage removal mechanism. So the common uh, gallium nitride wet etchants like sodium hydroxide and strong KOH solutions are not type selective. So a mechanism dependent on the majority carrier is required. The photoelectrochemical etch process depends on carriers that are photo excited by above band gap light. For our experiments, we used uh, a broadband xenon source to eliminate the etched samples in solution. As illustrated in the figure on the top right, in an n-type semiconductor in basic solution, the majority carriers will drift away from the surface and the minority holes will drift toward it. The opposite is the case in p-type semiconductors. Electrons will gravitate toward the surface. This supply of surface holes in n-type GAN permits uh, etching in a basic solution of UV illuminated n-type GAN while preventing it in p-type GAN. As you can see in the schematic on the bottom left, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, this etch requires a hole exchange surface and an electron exchange surface in the GAN, and then a chemical bath to facilitate both of these reactions. An ohmic contact uh, labeled the, the Thai gold contact on the bottom left um, uh, catalyzes the reaction and the etched process itself happens at the GAN surface. In solution, potassium hydroxide acts as a powerful oxidizer, dissociating OH anions and reducing the GAN surface. The UV light forms sulfate radicals from the potassium per sulfate, permitting an oxidation reaction to occur at the metal surface. This oxidation reaction balances the extraction of holes at the GAN surface, ensuring that the charged non-equilibrium doesn't cause the reaction to self-terminate. This mechanism leads us to the process flow in the bottom right. Uh, so we'll take a piece of P-type GAN, uh, induce this damage at the surface using icp Ri, place ohmic contacts to act as counter electrodes, etch away as much of the damaged uh, material as possible in a PEC solution, and then place P-type nickel gold contacts on the surface uh, to measure the electrical properties. Um, excuse me. Uh, so we characterize this, the effect of PEC on an, an etched damaged PGAN surface. First, the PGAN surfaces were etched for 30 seconds in icp Ri, and then the PEC etch was applied for two, four, or eight minutes. For the sake of time, I've only showed figures from the eight minute PEC etch and the ICP etch in the figures on the top right here. The surface morphology in AFM and SEM is shown after eight minutes. The sample surface has an RMS roughness of about 6 nan 0.6 nanometers, excuse me, after dry etching, and PEC roughens the sample surface to 1.35 nanometers after two minutes of PEC. This increases to 17 nanometers after four minutes and grows marginally smoother to about 10 nanometers after eight minutes. This is, this is consistent with the predicted damage depth and with the process of recovering surface morphology after a uniformly thick layer of damage is created on the surface. Finally, as you can see on the, the two figures in the bottom left, the transmission line, tra transmission line method patterns were formed on the PEC at surface and nickel gold metal contacts were deposited in contact annealed. IV data were measured from the ASGRON PGAN and it shows linear current conduction with a contact resistance of about three times 10 to the negative two ohm centimeters and a sheet resistance of two times 10 to the five, which are consistent with Hall measurements. Current conduction in the PEC etched samples, however, uh, shown here in the eight minute etch sample uh, is strongly rectifying in both directions, suggesting a poor metal semiconductor contact. These results suggest conduction along the surface rather than through the bulk of the GAN. The cause of this is the subject of future research. It's suspected that the exponentially decaying rather than the abrupt nature of the damage induced by dry etching may prohibit an abrupt self-termination of the PEC etch as the etch removes type flipped material and approaches the underlying uh, pristine PGAN. In conclusion, the removal of damaged material from ICP etched GAN by PEC is demonstrated through a novel application of photoelectrochemical etching by the surface morphological results of the work shown. However, the ohmic contact wasn't able to be made after the etch is complete and will be the subject of future research. In conclusion, the John Sullivan Professional Development Award enabled this presentation at the 13th ICNS in Bellevue, Washington, as you can see, is a suburb of Seattle. In addition to the presentation itself, I met and had discussions with a number of researchers from the Naval Research Laboratory, from Georgia Tech, Nagoya University in Japan, among many others. Beyond presenting my research, these experiences led to conversations with other researchers in my field and gave me new ideas for future research directions, as well as insight 
uh, about the work itself and about uh, ways that I can share it in the future. And it strengthened uh, my professional network and relationships. Thank you very much. Okie doke, I think that is my turn. Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Ben McEwen, and I'm also a third year grad student in Shadi's lab. Um, so I know what you're all thinking. Gosh, that ICNS sounded like a hoot. I wish I could hear a little bit more about it. Well, I gotcha. So I'd like to start with a, a brief background on the, the work that, that I've done here. Uh, so uh, again, Algan uh, power electronics are, are sort of the main focus of, of the work that I've been doing. So over the last few decades, the aluminum gallium nitride material system has proven itself to be pretty well suited for the high power and high frequency power switching applications. Um, so as an example, um, of the fast growing need for high performance power electronics. A modern vehicle can have dozens of electric components, uh, each of which require power delivery. And uh, ALGAN power devices are uniquely positioned to meet this growing need uh, because of the material's uh, unique intrinsic properties, including its wide band gap, high breakdown strength, and high mobility. Now this extremely high mobility uh, can be achieved by the epitaxial growth of uh, ALGAN on GAN. And so the, you couple the spontaneous polarization with the piezoelectric polarization that uh, occurs from the pseudomorphic growth of ALGAN on GAN. And that draws the electrons down to the hetero interface, which are then trapped in this two dimensional quantum well that, uh, that occurs as a result of the band offset between GAN and wider band gap ALGAN. And so this creates the so-called two-dimensional electron gas or 2 uh, without the need for intentional doping, which results in uh, high density and high mobility of electrons. So in order to make that into a transistor, all one has to do is uh, modulate the 2 and you can do that by applying a gate electrode. And so uh, the gate can either be a Schottky contact or a metal insulator semiconductor uh, gate, as I have shown here. And uh, in general, a MIS gate has lower leakage, uh, but a high density of interface states at, at this dielectric semiconductor interface can negatively impact the performance. So the improvement of the dielectric and the dielectric semiconductor interface for ALGAN-GAN MIS devices was the focus of the work that I presented at ICNS. So uh, taking a look here at the output and gate leakage characteristics of a Schottky gated hemp and aluminum, uh, aluminum oxide and silicon nitride mishemps, uh, we can see that both the dielectrics uh, drastically reduced gate leakage by over six orders of magnitude. However, um, in the case of the aluminum oxide mishemp, um, charges trapped in the oxide and at the interface resulted in little to no gate control. Um, so while silicon nitride can be relatively easily implemented as a gate dielectric, aluminum oxide requires some additional cons considerations. But because aluminum oxide is an attractive dielectric for GAN-based MIS, uh, because of its high band offset and high dielectric constant, we explored ways to improve the aluminum uh, oxide GAN MIS. So, First, looking at pre-deposition surface treatments to reduce the surface contamination on the GAN prior to dielectric deposition. Um, so shown here are some XPS spectra of the GAN surface after several different surface treatments. Um, and we can see that by cleaning the surface with a combination ammonium hydroxide plus uh, HCl HF cleaning procedure, uh, the carbon and the oxygen contaminants were drastically reduced. Um, and finally, we can use 
uh, a post-deposition anneal and forming gas ambient to reduce the density of interface states. Uh, shown here on the right are some capacitance voltage scans of AL203 GAN MIS capacitors, which were fabricated and annealed in forming gas uh, under different conditions. And we found that the greatest reduction in both hysteresis and frequency dispersion, uh, which corresponds to a reduction in the density of interface states and therefore a higher quality interface, uh, was observed after annealing at 350 C. And we can see here down on the bottom that higher temperature annealing actually started to degrade the device. Um, so I'd like to extend uh, one more really huge thank you to the John J. Sullivan um, Committee for giving me this wonderful opportunity to fly out to the West Coast uh, and attend the ICNS uh, conference in Bellevue. Um, I got to uh, interact and discuss my research with some of the world's leading experts in nitride semiconductors, which was really, uh, really cool. Um, and that sort of, that gave me a much deeper understanding of the way that my research kind of fit into the broader research community of nitride semiconductors. And it was uh, truly a wonderful experience. So uh, thank you so much. Okay, can everyone hear me okay? My name is uh, Jody Kraskoviak, and today I'll be talking about electron interactions with simple organic molecules. So this research uh, was enabled by the John J. Sullivan Award through the purchase of chemicals, UHV hardware, as well as funding my trip to the ABS conference last year. And at that conference, I was able to win the best student presentation for the Applied Service Science Division. So without that scholarship, or without the award, I wouldn't have been able to have that experience. So uh, first of all, let me start out with the motivation for this project, which is looking at the electron molecule interactions. There are many applications that need a better understanding of how these in electrons interact with organic molecules. One in specific is EUV lithography, where the ionizing radiation is high enough energy to produce a cascade of photoelectrons within the film. And uh, these electrons wind up causing uh, decomposition of those molecules. So to study these interactions, SAMs on gold equals a simple system to study them. And uh, a SAM is a self-assembled monolayer. The molecule that we chose for the study is one decade thiol. Uh, the molecule is shown here in the middle of the page. And um, what we do is we form films of this molecule on a gold 111 single crystal. Down here in the bottom corner, you can see the low energy electron diffraction patterns associated with the crystal structure of that molecule with respect to the gold surface. And what I want you to uh, get out of this is that the diffraction pattern associated with the SAM fades as a function of electron exposure. Uh, these experiments, or sorry, these images are collected under liquid nitrogen temperatures because it gives us a sharper diffraction pattern. So what's causing this disorder? Or this Is it displacement of the molecules or decomposition through bond breakage? So as a first principles experiment, we looked at simply the pristine uh, SAM on gold. After electron exposure, the diffraction pattern associated with the SAM has been completely faded. And then what we do is allow the sample to room back up to warm temp room temperature to anneal, give it a chance to reorder. And we see that some, but not all, of the diffraction pattern returns, indicating that there is some disordering, but some decomposition. So to look into that a little bit deeper, we, we use some other chemical analysis techniques, such as thermal program desorption, which is monitoring the outgassing species through mass spectrometry as you're heating up the sample. And so for the lying down phase, where the molecule is oriented horizontal to the substrate surface, we see very little change. So the solid lines here represent pre-electron exposure and the dashed lines are after ADUV electron exposure. And so between these two spectra, we do not see a large change um, in both the carbon and silver species. 
However, for the standing up phase, which is where the molecule is oriented in a vertical fashion to the substrate, we see a large attenuation in the carbon fragments and a shift in the sulfur fragments towards lower desorption temperatures, indicating that there is chemical change occurring to the film. So this only gives us a piece of the puzzle. And to look a little deeper, we used angle of resolved XPS. And so uh, in the top here, what you see is a atomic percent versus angle, takeoff angle. And what that gives us an indication of is um, the uh, thickness of the film, essentially. And so if you look at the gold versus carbon signal, we see a crossover point for the lying down phase towards higher angles, because the lying down phase is a thinner film due to the thickness of the molecule. Whereas the standing up phase is a thicker film and the crossover point is at a shallower angle, indicating a thicker film because it's the length of the molecule on the surface. The solid lines represent pre-exposure and dashed are after ADEV electron exposure. In the lying down phase, we do not see a large change in that sh uh, crossover point. However, for the standing up phase, we see a large shift towards higher angles, indicating a, uh, a transition in the film thickness towards thinner films. If we look at the elemental composition of the carbon 1s and the sulfur 2p peaks, what we see is that there is a, um, is my cursor still there? I've lost my cursor. But anyway, um, the blue versus green curve uh, shows a shift in binding energy towards lower binding energies after electron exposure in the standing up phase. However, for the lying down phase, we do not see a shift in the carbon 1s peak, indicating that there is a dependence on molecular orientation to the sensitivity to the beam. As well as the sulfur peaks, uh, what we see before and after electron exposure of the standing up phase is addition of sulfur species in both phases actually, both lying down phase, the addition of sulfur species. And so what we can achieve from looking at all this data uh, from the uh, different techniques is that ADEV electron irradiation causes both disorder and decomposition of these molecules. And the orientation of the molecule with respect to the surface substrate plays a large role on the sensitivity to electron exposure. Both the carbon-carbon and carbon-sulfur bonds are bring, being broken upon exposure. However, the carbon-carbon bond sensitivity is more strongly dependent with the orientation. Um, I would like to take this time to say thank you again to the John J. Sullivan Award for enabling this research presented here today and to thank you for your attention. everyone. Um, my name is May. I'm a fourth year graduate student from Dr. Melendez. And I would like to thank John Sullivan um, Award for giving me opportunity to attend the SFRBM 2018-25th Annual Conference. SFRBM stands for Society for Redox Biology and Medicine. Um, it was established in 1987 to study the dark side of the oxygen as a major issue for the life sciences. The research in, during this conference focused on how oxygen is both necessary and toxic at the same time to all the life forms. The conference was held in Chicago um, and it lasted four days. The conference was broken down into these sections. We have pre-meeting workshop, which is a day before the actual um, meeting officially begins. It provides overview of cutting edge methodologies and prevailing mechanistic concepts and the latest redox-based therapeutic approaches. Each day of the um, conference begins with Sunrise Free Radical School. It provides background knowledge for all the basic redox biology that you need for the following talks. For example, on day one, if the um, plenary sections, the talks of the plenary section focus on nitric oxide related research, the Sunrise Free Radical School will provide all the information 
um, all the basic information that you need to understand all those plenary sections. I really like this Sunrise Free Radical School because instead of like you requiring you to search up on information during while listening the talk, it gives you like all the basic understanding that you need, so you're very prepared. Then we have plenary section. Um, it's cover a lot of latest redox re research topic. And since redox biology is a very widely researched topic, it is broken down into two sections. With each of the section has its own unique category. For example, on day one, the plenary section one would have cancer related um, redox biology and the section two would have mitochondria related redox biology. So depending on your interest, you can select which talk you wanna attend to so that it can benefit you the most. We have series of presentation followed by plenary section. Um, this is given by a lot of um, professional experts like faculties or um, like faculties. And then we also have our presentations given by postdocs or graduate students. And lastly, we have poster presentations. Poster presentations followed by hospitality. It's a very good time for your networking. It gives you plenty of time to form network with other experts for potential um, postdoc position and potential collaboration. So this is what my poster look like for the conference. Um, I won't be going over any of these data. Um, I just wanna share with you guys what my poster look like. I will be giving um, a talk at the NanoBio seminar on the April 29th if you want, if you're interested in my research. So overall, um, the conference provide opportunity to explore the cutting edge methods in research. It gave you a lot of useful idea that you can actually use for your future experiments um, for um, the project. It also provide a really great opportunity to create um, connection, networking, get to know all the experts. It's, it's awesome. Um, I was the most challenging part of this conference is summarizing my poster presentation in a two minute elevator pitch, but it was a really good practice. I was able to introduce my project to all the experts and I got a lot of feedbacks and a lot of ideas on how to how I can improve with my project. If you're really interested in the redox biology, I highly recommend um, attending this conference. Lastly, I would like to, again, thank John Sullivan Award, the um, Award Selection Committee, and the school for giving me opportunity and supporting my travel needs to attend this conference. Thank you. Hi, um, this is Pujita here. I work in Dr. Shost Susan Shostein and Dr. Yubin Shee's lab. Uh, today I'm here to talk about my experience in presenting my research title, Biomimetic Scaffolds Targeting Regeneration of the Salivary Gland at a Gordon Research Conference uh, in Galveston, Texas in February of 2019. So Gordon Research Conferences are usually uh, international conferences with uh, where the conference topic is extremely focused uh, in the biological, chemical, physical, or engineering sciences. The topic of my conference was salivary glands and exocrine biology. So yes, it was extremely focused, not soft tissue glands in general. Uh, it was um, specifically the salivary gland and exocrine biology. So the number of people attending the conference was small. It was 300, not... Um, the usual 5,000 or 6,000 in a huge international conference. And that was specifically useful in trying to interact with the uh, entire community. All of the speakers are leading experts in the field. And so the quality of uh, each presentation was extremely high. 
Um, and the format of the conference was in such a way that um, you end up learning a lot in a span of a week. Uh, you interact with almost all of them um, that have attended the conference and you not only network with them, but also form deep friendships with uh, a lot of them. So um, the conference starts with a seminar on the first day that is geared exclusively towards uh, graduate students and postdocs. Um, so um, student, there's both a poster session and all of the oral presentations that uh, have been selected through the abstract, they're all on day one and students feel a lot more comfortable presenting amongst other students and um, uh, postdocs. So from day two onwards, the um, actual conference starts and it goes on for another five days. Um, it's uh, a bit overwhelming because it goes on from 9 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. and there are all these back-to-back -back sessions. Um, it's a lot of information to process. And um, after 9.30 p.m., there's this very informal networking session until 12 midnight where um, all of the attendees um, have um, very laid back uh, conversations. And this was extremely helpful in making the everyday sessions more interactive because the previous day everyone would have talked to everyone else. And so um, it's not a very small conference, but it has about 300 people, but you get to know uh, a lot of them uh, and know a lot more about what's going on in everyone else's lab. Apart from um, the daily, network session, daily networking session, it was one of the main highlights. Um, there were also career advancement and empowerment of women in science sessions where um, they speak about, um, they spoke about how uh, mentors are important in uh, your life to both uh, help you proceed uh, forward in your career and personal life. So um, for me personally, this, conference was a crash course on all of the biology that I needed to know to um, go ahead and uh, improve all of the engineering that is needed to complement the biology. And so my work, I presented my work, which focused on fabricating uh, three-dimensional substrates by a technique that I modified to, um, uh, to yield uh, substrates with surfaces uh, with topographies that were vastly different from what uh, the topographies are reported in literature um, when using this technique. And the, the substrates that I fabricated, they had a topography, very, topography and viscoelastic nature, very similar to uh, the native extracellular matrix in um, the salivary gland. Um, I also presented work where I showed um, growing cells on these scaffolds and how the cells were able to um, maintain their function and morphology. Um, I was very pleased that um, despite being a biology conference and my work was geared more towards engineering, um, I was able to receive a Best Poster Award and all of this uh, would not have been possible if not for uh, funding from um, the uh, John J. Sullivan uh, Fellowship and coordination from um, the Office of Graduate Studies and um, the Selection Committee. So thank you all of you for uh, uh, being here. Uh, for your attention and uh, yeah I'll, I'll give it over to Bridget to present her experience. Uh, Bridget, I think your audio is off. Sorry, um, is everyone able to hear me now? Yes, you're yeah, back. That's good. Okay, good. Sorry about that. Let me go back to sharing. 
Okay, take two. So I hope everyone's doing well in these trying times. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is B. Boland. Um, I'm a fourth year PhD student here at SUNY Polytechnic Institute. Um, and I work under Dr. Harry F. Stadiatis and Dr. Gregory Dumbo. Um, and my work last year was in sensor reliability, uh, which I was working on under Dr. Dumbo and with Mike Fancher. So I just want to start off with why I applied to the John J. Sullivan um, scholarship. Uh, so I had gotten accepted into two different conferences um, in last spring, and one of them, a paper was accepted and the other one a poster. So at the Advanced Semiconductor Manufacturing Conference up in Saratoga, um, I had a first author peer reviewed paper accepted, uh, which was a very exciting time as a PhD student as it was my first one. Um, and I really applied to have my conference attendance fee and my travel fees, especially since I live out by Massachusetts, um, the travel fee of driving back up and down every day, um, covered. Um, and this was specifically important because with the CSHA, which is um, EHS for High Technology Conference in Arizona, I did receive a scholarship from CSHA to attend that conference. However, it didn't cover my entire flight. So I had you know, a few hundred dollars being asked for by uh, ASMC and I had a few hundred dollars being asked for by uh, CSHA. So having um, the John J. Sullivan conference able to cover some of those costs was really uh, a great financial impact. So that way I could go to both conferences, get the networking professional development experiences at both um, without having any financial worries or burden. So both these conferences were back to back. Uh, and the first one, uh, CSHA, as I mentioned, was in Arizona, Scottsdale to be specific. Um, you can see my poster there. Uh, it's very tiny in the screen, um, but it was basically on the using the Weibull function, um, which is a way of taking failure data and estimating when the mean time to failure would be or to see what different failure modes you have. Um, and I applied them to different um, sensor technologies in the fab. Uh, with partnership with the Toxic Gas Monitoring System Office at CNSC. Uh, we mostly focus on methane sensors, uh, but there are a couple other um, chemistries that I focus on as well. Um, up at the top, you can see a picture of me with all of the other student presenters, those of us who had won the student poster scholarship and were able to receive some funding and free lodging to attend the conference. Um, and in the lower right hand corner, you can see me at the um, award ceremony at the end of the conference where I won an honorable mention, um, which was a great time uh, and definitely made me feel like I was able to get great feedback on my work and also felt great to see that other people enjoyed my work. Um, in terms of the CESHA conference, what helped me with my professional development, um, there was a very big career fair where I was able to talk to many different uh, companies, specifically NREL. So those of you who know my research now, I focus a lot um, in photovoltaics and fuel cell. So NREL is one of those companies uh, that I would just love to work for. And I met uh, 20 people who worked there. They almost sent an entire group uh, to this conference. So that was a great experience to be able to talk to them and talk about my research that related to them and get their feedback on my research. So the second conference a week later was at ASMC. Um, and in the bottom left-hand corner, that was the first slide of my presentation that I gave there, um, which was a 20 minute presentation at eight in the morning. And a surprising amount of people came. Um, it was the last day of the conference. And I remember thinking, oh, no one's gonna see it. But I had a lot of questions, a lot of interest. Um, this was a project that I don't think I really understood the impact of until I went to these conferences and was able to hear from those working in the fabs right now and how much sensor reliability is on their mind and something that they need to improve their research on. Um, I also have in the top left hand corner that is the website where my paper is hosted and then the first page of my paper is over on the right. So I want to say thank you and point out some of the other um, experiences that I was able to have uh, during these conferences uh, that luckily I was able to get the John J. Sullivan Scholarship to support. Um, up in the upper left hand corner, um, I hiked Camelback Mountain in Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, if any of you have been there, it does just look like a camel sitting down in the distance. Um, and that was actually planned for by CSHA. So 
it wasn't just something that I went and did by myself or with other students, but it was students, it was um, employees from different industries, it was CSHA members, we all went up there together. Um, and it was a great way to really make connections and bond with people, um, connections that I know I can use later for internships or jobs or just advice. Um, I was also, if you look at the picture next to it on the right, I was able to go do the Scottsdale Arts Walk. Um, and that was a really great fun experience to kind of see uh, the art community and try different foods. Um, and then I'm also on the right, that is me in front of my poster. Uh, we presented right in the front hallway where the registration table was. So people had to pass by our posters every day, um, which really helped get a lot of people interested and have a lot of communication back and forth. Um, in the bottom right hand corner, I did also attend the Women in Semiconductor um, a meeting at ASMC last year, which was a great way to connect with other women in the industry. Uh, specifically, I made, met some great ones from GE and GF, um, who I was actually able to connect with later on to talk about co-ops um, and to go to different events that were at GE and Global Foundries later on. Um, and then the bottom left-hand corner, that's my brother's dog, Rudy. My brother lives in Saratoga, so when I attended ASMC, I stayed with him, and that was Rudy sleeping on my lap while I uh, was just practicing for my presentation. So I just want to say thank you uh, to the Scholarship Review Committee. Thank you to the Office of Graduate uh, Studies and Research for organizing this um, and helping all of us students out each year. And congratulations to all of the other recipients. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I think I can speak for um, some of my colleagues that we look forward to seeing what you guys have done. Um, this is, I know, a highlight for me um, for the for the year to see, you know, what um, what you all are able to do with this with this fellowship um, um, opportunity. So thank you again for for sharing everything. Um, if anyone has any questions, you know, please let us know. Um, but um, I know Mike Yakimoff had, had a few words that he wanted to share about John Sullivan. Um, so I'll, I'll let Mike say a few words. Thank you. Uh, I think I'm uh, one of not uh, too many people uh, in this chat who remember John personally. Just want to check, uh, to tell a quick story about what, uh, about, uh, what happened once upon a time. Uh, basically, we had a discussion about uh, vacuum systems on one of the uh, one of the seminars, and the discussion uh, went towards uh, vacuum in space and technology as uh, which can be developed on orbit. Uh, it turned out uh, John was involved in uh, this project. Uh, it's called Wakefield Facility. It, f it flew a few times on space shuttle in the 90s. And uh, I was actually, uh, that was actually a quite interesting project from my perspective. Uh, uh, since apparently I was, uh, I was excited about it. And uh, John had a t-shirt uh, from the project. I, if you can see the video, it's on me right now. Uh, so in a few days, I got an invitation uh, to his office and this t-shirt as a gift. Well, if you will, a, a version zero of this award. Whatever it was. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mike. Well, thank you all for, um, for attending today. Um, and um, to all of our students, you know, please don't hesitate to contact me. I know you can't stop in right now, but, um, you know, please don't hesitate to email me. I'm happy to meet with you virtually um, or by phone. And um, I hope that everyone has a, a great weekend. If there aren't any questions, I think we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, so, so thanks again and, and take care and stay safe, everyone. <laughs>